we can go ahead and get started. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming to this session. It's going to be on the OpenSSF Salsa and the NIST SSDF. Um, it's, these are two emerging software supply chain security best practices frameworks, and we'll be using these to actually construct a roadmap. Um, before we get into it, my name is Tony Lohr. Hi. <laughs> I uh, work as a developer advocate and uh, evangelist for SciCode. Um, I previously worked at uh, Intuit as a software engineer on uh, several teams and uh, worked at a um, uh, bio lab for that. So as I briefly mentioned, our agenda today will be uh, introducing uh, certain supply chain attacks, discuss the statistics around those, and explain why these frameworks were created in the first place. Then we'll get into the NIST SSDF, Google Salsa, the specifics of them. We'll compare them, figure out what gaps emerge still. And uh, yeah, then we'll be able to construct a pretty comprehensive security framework. Uh, I forgot to take a demo off of this. There is no demo because it's a vendor neutral pitch. But uh, yes. So getting started, uh, let's answer the question of why we need new application security frameworks. Well, it's because attackers are shifting priority. Rather than going for production apps directly, we're seeing uh, a lot of attackers go uh, through software delivery pipelines and even use developers as uh, potential vectors of attack. Developer credentials are uh, highly sought after for attackers for that reason, because they typically have escalated privileges as uh, that reduces um, friction in the development processes. Unfortunately, it's resulted in an, a, uh, a landscape where uh, software supply chain attacks are on the rise. Everyone in this room has probably heard of SolarWinds if you're here, um, as well as most likely CodeCub as well. Uh, Xcode Spy has a bit of a, a, uh, a soft spot in my heart, if you could say that, because I was actually hit by that attack when I worked as an iOS engineer. Um, Kaseya is similar. Um, regardless, you can see that these types of attack are tr uh, trending upwards, and uh, Gartner actually Gartner actually predicts that 45% of organizations worldwide will have experienced attacks on their software supply chain, um, which is a threefold increase from only a few years before. So, let's get into the NIST SSDF, which is. Uh, a framework that was created um, in response to an executive order um, surrounding um, supply chain security, particularly around the Colonial Pipeline attack. Um, this particular uh, framework was directly inspired by OWASP SAM and Liz Gartner at the White House and the Department of Defense's General Resources. This uh, presidential executive order um, to go over it at a high level, coordinated efforts across multiple federal agencies to create a common language set, and that's really the, the key to this. It's creating a common language uh, for vendors, customers, and consumers of uh, certain frameworks to be able to actually communicate effectively. Now, software supply chain security um, is a particular focus because often commercial software lacks transparency and there is insufficient focus on the ability of software to resist attack. Uh, when we talk about visibility, um, we really uh, are talking about the, the shadow dev and shadow IT problems that tend to exist. Um, very often, and I've been guilty of this myself, uh, developers will use a library um, to accomplish a particular task, something mundane typically like data calls or perhaps math, but um, oftentimes <laughs> uh, attackers also uh, realize that this is the case and use that as a vector. Uh, going over the specific tasks outlined by uh, the, the NIST framework, um, pretty much every task has been completed as of now and NIST has released version 1.1 of the SSDF. Um, this, uh, this particular um, push also helped organizations define what critical software was uh, within their pipelines. Let's see. Software supply chain security is another uh, key to this aspect. Uh, NIST actually released three total documents uh, related to improving so, uh, software supply chain security. This includes the SD SSDF, which I'll be covering a bit more in detail, but also spe uh, special publication 800-161 uh, contains quite a bit of information about this. It re uh, refers a bit more to um, Internet of Things, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, so yeah, not quite our focus today. Um, I can skip that particular slide. Cybersecurity labeling for consumers, as I described, um, entails creating 
basic labeling to actually be able to describe security to customers in a consistent manner. Um, NIST identifies key elements of this labeling program and uh, has actually completely released a final version of this criteria, which is available uh, for pretty much anyone to use. Um, there are five key drives um, with, behind this labeling. It's to encourage innovation, be practical and not burdensome. In other words, actually usable. Uh, factor in usability as a key condition. Build on national and international experiences, in other words, using battle-tested strategies, and allow for a diversity of ideas, as long as they're deemed useful and effective. So, boiling down to five principles of the SSDF, we have protect, confidentiality, identity, rapid response, and training. I'll, uh, I'll let folks take pictures if they want to. Uh, another key deliverable of this particular uh, framework is the risk severity schema. Uh, the one I like to point out is level three because that actually is a bit more uh, prescriptive um, for federal agencies. If uh, an agency is deemed to be critical infrastructure, as we said before, then there are mandatory reporting requirements that they have to adhere to with regards to breaches. In addition, the SSDF uh, recommends minimum standards for developer uh, verifications of code. Uh, this includes static analysis, utilizing threat modeling, uh, running dynamic analysis, which includes tools such as fuzzers or uh, um, code-based structural test cases, and uh, something I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, uh, checking included SBOMs. SBOMs are great, but if you're not consuming them, what are they really doing? And the key practices, to boil it down, are preparing your organization, protecting your software, produce well-secured software, and respond to vulnerabilities in a timely, effective manner. Um, respond to vulnerabilities is a bit vague by uh, the NIST SSCF's um, definition, and that's because this framework is, it's not a rubric per se. It is very much a set of guidelines. Now, if we get into the OpenSSF's Salsa, Sorry if I have Google Salsa on the, uh, on the agenda. I, um, I was made aware very recently that it no longer goes by Google Salsa, so if I have any typos related to that, forgive me. But uh, <laughs> anyways, OpenSSF's Salsa framework uh, was actually introduced by Google several years ago. They've been consuming it internally, and I believe it was binary authorization for Borg or something like that. Uh, regardless, uh, it's designed to help protect the data fidelity uh, within the build systems. I have a nice threat model in here that I can show momentarily. And uh, one of the most notable attributes of uh, the SSDF's, <laughs> of OpenSSF's Salsa's levels is the fact that there are four different levels. And unlike several other cybersecurity frameworks, namely the SSDF, uh, the eventual goal of every company should be to hit level four because this is the highest um, level of security. Salsa level zero <laughs> is basically just a, a tongue-in-cheek way of saying that there is no guarantees. Uh, Salsa level one means that the build process must be fully scripted and generate provenance. Not particularly difficult. Most organizations hit Salsa level one without trying to. And Salsa level two requires using a version control and a hosted build service that generates authenticated provenance. This is a bit more difficult, and this, though not being particularly challenging to implement, uh, does entail some more uh, authorizations. Three is where things start to get a bit challenging. It's where the source and the build platforms meet specific standards to guarantee the auditability of the source and integrity of the governance, respectively. What that basically means is that um, the actual build, the logs, and the source have to be retained, ideally indefinitely, but 18 months is the minimum that's often prescribed. It's also level four, it's the most difficult to achieve, but it also enforces the highest rigor of standards. Uh, this involves uh, having a two-person review of all changes in a hermetic reproducible build process. Technically, the reproducibility isn't a requirement, but there needs to be a good reason for it not to be reproducible if uh, this is not something the organization hits. Uh, requiring a two-person review, though, is very much industry, industry standard, and there's virtually uh, no reason why that can't be achieved. 
This is the threat model that I was referring to. I particularly like this because it really just shows how many vectors of attack do exist, particularly with uh, modern software. And something I would like to point out is each dependency has its own pipeline. And uh, I'm sure anyone who was involved in resolving the log4j instance uh, is aware that it, it, sometimes it's not your dependencies. It can be your dependencies, dependencies that introduce the vulnerabilities. Let's see, there are five main categories of salsa requirements. There's source requirements, build requirements, provenance generation requirements, provenance content requirements, and, co and common requirements. To get in that, into that a little bit deeper, um, I actually wrote an article on Google's, um, on how to use our platform to achieve source requirements a while back, highly recommend. But the actual uh, source uh, requirements, it, they just entail having version controlled, um, which is pretty easy to do if you use GitHub, GitLab, or any other source control system. I don't know many developers who don't. Um, but this history needs to be verified as well. Um, and it needs to be strongly authenticated. This entails enforcing MFA or uh, two-factor authentication for your uh, developers as well. Um, retaining this information indefinitely, uh, as I said before, it's not 100% necessary at level three to retain it indefinitely, but to hit salsa level four, this information does need to be available uh, regardless of the amount of time that's passed. And uh, yes, uh, having it be two-person reviewed, specifically to trusted parties, um, helps prevent any sort of malicious developers. It helps prevent malicious commits. It can even be used to identify uh, suspicious code before it even is committed in the first place. Let's see. Moving on to the build requirements. This Essentially, it all goes back to uh, if you want to improve the security of your build, you have to make it less likely to be tampered with. Having a build that takes variables that can change uh, is just a way of introducing another potential vector of attack. Uh, Google Salsa really, OpenSSF Salsa really aspires to, uh, to protect the build uh, above most other aspects. Getting into the provenance, um, this uh, is pretty closely related to creating an SBOM. Um, but beyond just having the software, uh, it also entails having provenance of the build itself. Uh, in order to the, achieve the, uh, the highest possible level for Salsa, you have to have all your dependencies included within this provenance. Going a little bit deeper into the provenance content, uh, there are a, there's a laundry list of things that should be included. I don't feel as though I should go too deeply into all of them for the sake of time, but yeah, I'm going to break my own rule. <laughs> um, you, uh, organizations should include the artifacts, the builders, and the source um, in pretty much all of their provenance content. It's one of the few ways to ensure that uh, tampering hasn't occurred. Um, I would like to call out, though, um, including metadata is not a requirement for Salsa either. Um, but yes, that being said, the re reproducible information and uh, transitive dependencies should be included which also tells a little bit more information than just showing the metadata. Here's an example of uh, provenance content as I see it. I um, wonder where my notes went, oh well. And lastly, our uh, Salsa's common requirements. This includes security requirements, which includes having some sort of baseline security standard to prevent compromise. Often this is described as um, Sorry. Often this is uh, described as a uh, baseline framework or a contingency plan, and that's something that Salsa doesn't cover as well. It doesn't describe any sort of contingency plans. It's basically a means of preventing compromise in the first place. Uh, access is pretty intuitive as well, but it just involves physically protecting your code um, from actual attackers who could potentially tamper with it in person. Uh, in addition, super users really just refers to the uh, actual individuals who have admin privileges over your, um, over your code. You don't want to have no super users because frankly, there will always be break glass scenarios that happen. That being said, you should very carefully select who those individuals are and they should not be able to make changes alone. So based on this, what are our key learnings from the SSDF and Salsa? The SSDF focuses more on what 
where salsa focuses a bit more on how. And what I mean by that is that the NIST SSDF is more focused on defining minimum requirements for software use, used within critical infrastructure, particularly federally. Uh, it doesn't really refer to any specific contingency strategies that you should employ. Conversely, OpenSSF focuses a lot more on how. Um, this is a specific model for scoring the supply chain focused on improving security within the build phase throughout deployment. It's essentially a rubric. Uh, you might notice that uh, tiers versus levels are tiers and levels within these frameworks sound relatively the same. Uh, however, um, and you'd be partially right because higher tiers slash levels do uh, relate to uh, higher rigors of, uh, of cybersecurity. Uh, however, higher tiers within the NIST, NIST SSDF um, uh, represents increasing degrees of rigor and sophistication in the risk management processes, whereas higher levels within SALSA represents greater maturity, and each level of SALSA acts as a milestone towards the eventual goal of achieving SALSA 4. This might sound strange, but achieving the highest tier of the SSDF is not for every organization, because frankly, it, employing cybersecurity uh, does introduce some friction to your business processes, and of course there is a large overhead to install them in the first place. If you're a financial institution, these checks can't be skipped though. Uh, PCI requirements and plenty of other compliance checks uh, very much necessitate that, but let's say you have, I don't know, <laughs> a, a fun app or something like that. There, there could be arguments that you don't need to spend your time doing that. Salsa is not like that at all though. Um, with Salsa, you should aspire to hit higher levels. Um, one particular uh, best practice that NIST calls out that I want to po uh, point out is reviewing for hard-coded secrets. And these hard-coded secrets don't just appear in source code. Granted, they're often unintentionally introduced in source code, but I've seen builds, I've seen logs, I've seen several other aspects. Uh, registries as well contain secrets. So scanning for these throughout the SDLC is important. In addition, uh, enforcing strong governance of security policy is recommended by both SALSA and NIST. Um, pretty much every common requirement of SALSA uh, goes back to governance. You need to uh, enforce strong access control. You need to enforce super user access. You need to enforce security baseline. Uh, it is, it's very much prescriptive of uh, governance, whereas uh, the NIST special publication uh, 800.5.3, which is security and privacy controls for information systems, is actually referenced specifically by SALSA as a great guideline um, for, uh, for governance. Detecting and remediating misconfigurations is also recommended by the uh, NIST SSDF. Um, this includes maintaining a system configuration or correction and inventory of the systems used and the configurations that they have. This can include hardware, software, firmware, documentation, build pipelines, pretty much everything that touches your code. Um, enforcing security configuration settings for IT products helps prevent uh, a DevOps person's worst nightmare, which is probably configuration drift. Not, no, that, that's actually probably a surprise audit, but configuration drift is pretty close up there. Um, now, one of the other best practices I really love is uh, Salsa recommends reducing code tampering risk by enforcing source requirements, e.g. having a two-person review, which can prevent, it, it can prevent a pissed off uh, consultant from potentially pushing mal uh, malevolent code, or it could just prevent a, uh, an attacker from inserting a small amount of, uh, of uh, compromised code. Um, in addition, enforcing build requirements, such as ensuring hermetic builds and utilizing code signing helps reduce this code tampering risk. However, these two frameworks are excellent, but they don't cover everything that should be done to mitigate risk. And personally, when I was reading through them, I noticed some glaring gaps that I think can be improved upon. Specifically, identifying suspicious behavior and code leaks. Um, source code is a software company's intellectual property. I think we can all agree on that. Um, save open source, of course, because that's our property. <laughs> uh, neither NIST nor Google Frameworks address the need for identifying suspicious behavior, though. Um, Salsa does suggest some preventative measures, and the SSDF suggests to have a contingency plan in place, which I think both allude to the idea of 
uh, having anomaly detection, but neither say it explicitly. Um, addition, um, enforcing the principle of least privilege, despite not being explicitly said by either organization, uh, helps protect uh, code by, or correction, helps protect your build pipelines by preventing a breach of one component from spilling over to another. Preventing lateral movement is probably one of the best things that an organization should, should do, and it's also uh, key to uh, enforcing zero trust. Uh, hardening the configurations, such as having uh, strong version control policies, hardening the security of CICD pipelines, maintaining an up-to-date and current inventory of all your configurations, and um, inserting some processes for um, password rotation also um, can improve this. Additionally, verifying the code integrity through each stage of the SDLC uh, can help um, protect your code from potential tampering. Uh, centrally managing your policies allows you to enforce your policies consistently across the SDLC as well. Putting it in other terms, if you have a suit of armor and it's full of holes, it probably won't help you too much. So in the same way, an organization should have oversight into every single asset they have because well, if you can't, if you don't know what you have, then uh, you can't really protect it. Kind of an interesting statistic. I've probably said it to a few of you uh, just walking around. Um, but about 60% of all breaches that have occurred in the last few years have actually utilized a, an unpatched dependency with a known fix at, within their attack path, which is really just another way of saying you could prevent 60% of breaches by keeping your stuff updated. <laughs> Um, simple as it sounds, it's, it's, it's difficult to do, especially if you're an organization that has, say, 500 repositories and a several thousand developers. And as I said before, anomaly detection is the last point that um, I, I think that these frameworks miss. Um, we need to be able to identify anomalies in access, particularly access grants. If I'm a UK, uh, a UK based company and suddenly I'm seeing logins from I don't know, Western Russia, chances are I'd probably want to uh, be aware of that or at least alert my security, security team about that fact. Uh, in addition, anomalies and configurations, such as uh, configurations um, drifting from one of your deployments can potentially expose uh, your proprietary code. Uh, one particular example, let's say you have a Kubernetes uh, cluster that is publicly viewable and publicly accessible but for some reason it originates from a repository that's set to private, well, chances are those are conflicting configurations that should be called out and investigated because a best case scenario, it's just a minor, um, a minor oversight. Worst case scenario though, it could be a full on code leak and uh, uh, code leaks are something that you want to avoid because you're basically doing an attacker's reconnaissance work for them in addition to potentially exposing hard coded secrets that could theoretically exist. I uh, finished way faster than I meant to, super sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I have some additional resources on, uh, on the particular cybersecurity frameworks that I discussed today, as well as several others. And uh, yeah, um, we can hop right into Q&A. You're leaving me hanging, I get it. So the question is how can we use the SSDF and uh, Salsa to show that our customers and demonstrate the fact that we are taking security seriously, if I understand it properly? Well, that's kind of the, the beautiful thing about it. Um, if you can generate provenance and attestations that you are following these cybersecurity frameworks, then chances are that's a great sign. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of organizations don't specifically enforce um, a particular fr uh, framework, but um, I mean, like ISO 27001 uh, is one example of a framework that is not required by law per se. Like they're not gonna, you're not gonna get hit with penalties like you would if you say violated PCI DSS, but it does improve customer confidence. And that is ultimately what adhering to these uh, cybersecurity frameworks goes back to. It is showing your customers that you are taking their security seriously. But um, it, in addition to that though, it also shows that you're not being negligent. Um, not all attacks and not all breaches are created equally. I, I feel like 
we can generally agree on that. Um, and a, an attack that, say, uses a, a strange mathematical-based zero-day attack that has never been seen before. I, I feel like you can cut a, a company a certain amount of slack for that type of attack. However, if they are breached because of a vulnerability that they have in one of their dependencies that had a fix come out two years ago, well, that's just negligence. So I don't know. Hopefully that helped explain. Yes. Oh, no worries. Um, if I understand the question correctly, you're saying that how could you show your customers your compliance if, uh, if your customer has no reason to believe your organization because of, say, uh, a fox watches the hen house situation? Um, I don't have a good answer to that one, unfortunately. Um, I, I suspect that we'll see a good solution to that in the future. But also using a certain security tools, um, like the ones we offer, um, are pretty good for uh, being able to generate these attestations. And um, especially if you have uh, policies that you've written into your security, but like the policy is code, not just a, a written policy, um, you can uh, enforce that continuously um, through pretty much every commit. So in that way, you can ensure that compliance is upheld at a, a certain level uh, pretty continuously. Hopefully that kind of explained the question, and hopefully I didn't miss the core of it. And I saw one more hand over here. Uh, is there any implementation guidance for open source maintainers if they want to implement these frameworks? The question is, is there any guidance for open source maintainers that wish to um, utilize this framework? The answer is yes, absolutely, for Salsa. Um, the SSDF uh, is, I'm not going to say it's particularly dense, but there's definitely quite a bit of information to it. And uh, it's a bit more descriptive versus being prescriptive. Salsa is very prescriptive. It, as I said, it, it is a rubric. Um, so and I, I personally view that as being a bit, for that reason, being a bit easier to achieve for an open source maintainer, particularly one who's doing it on their own time. Um, whereas SSDF is a bit more involved because that also involves a bit of high-level strategy of, uh, okay, what's our risk tolerance? What's the amount of money we're willing to allocate towards improving security? Whereas, uh, whereas Salsa is a bit more straightforward. Uh, NIST is slowly orienting on an action plan to have more explicit guidance for the uh, open source community. It, it sure is, yeah. And, uh, any more? <laughs> 